Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Gavin Pikes. I'm an honours student at UWA with the Medical Physics Group and my project this year has been with Monte Carlo simulations in the modelling and optimization on the neck bunker shielding with my supervisors being David and Petron. So a brief little overview of my talk. So I'll be going over the introduction of my project, so mainly in terms of Monte Carlo and its application to Linux shielding, the aims of my project, a basic literature overview, my methods and results, and then the limitations and future work, as well as my conclusion. Oh. So beginning with Monte Carlo, um, Monte Carlo method. So Monte Carlo simulations use random sampling to simulate events and interactions. So what this means is rather than solving for complex multidimensional integrated differential equations, which as the name implies are quite uh, involved and uh, not the easiest thing in the world, we can instead use random sampling to track particles as they move through a medium. So what we're doing is tracking, say, a photon as it uh, interacts with matter and assigning a probability from a random number generator to determine the probability of an interaction and then tracking that particle as it uh, interacts and scatters through our medium and until it either leaves our area of geometric interest or uh, falls below a threshold energy. So in doing this, we're able to track these microscopic, um, track these particles on a microscopic stochastic um, scale, such that we can then collate these particles together to then form a deterministic macroscopic description of the radiation uh, behavior on like a larger scale. So this obviously requires a uh, for the tracking of billions of particles. So uh, in my case, I've been using between 10 to the um, uh, 3 billion and 30 billion particles. So as the error for Monte Carlo simulations is proportional to one on the square root of n, n being the number of histories run, in order to decrease the error of simulations by a factor of 10, you need to run 100 times more particles. So obviously the computational time, uh, the computational power required becomes quite intensive quite quickly if you want to decrease that error down to a usable amount. It's only really been in the last couple of decades or so that I'd say Monte Carlo simulations have been particularly relevant in um, research as com the computational power is actually now caught up to the point where uh, you can actually uh, use uh, with low enough uncertainties to produce uh, usable data. And obviously there's a wide variety of codes used to actually uh, produce these Monte Carlo simulations in. So I'm using Gate, which is a uh, plug-in for Giant 4, a Monte Carlo simulation developed by CERN, and then more specifically, this is dealing with um, medical applications. So Monte Carlo in bunker shielding. So traditionally, shielding calculations are done through the NCRP 151 document. So this provides a list of equations that determine the shielding capabilities of bunkers. However, these are much more limited to very simple like box-like Linux bunker designs. So they struggle when being applied to more complex bunker designs, such as seen um, here with the Mary Linac bunker at Sir Charles Garden Hospital. Uh, additionally, these uh, equations provided by NCRP 151 tend to be over conservative in shielding. So there was a paper by Rijkin in 2019 that looked at 73 bunker designs and found there was over shielding up to 43%. So they tend to add an unnecessary cost to bunker designs. So when we use the Monte Carlo simulations, we can instead provide a much more individualized um, analysis of the bunker shielding capabilities and then determine the, the optimal way of producing that bunker from there, I guess. So Monte Carlo simulations are also the only way of determining the depth dose curves within the walls of the bunker. So obviously we can't drill a hole out in the primary barrier, put an ionization chamber in there and then measure the um, dose from there. So obviously that would be perturbing the fluence quite drastically. So Monte Carlo simulations are really the gold standard for determining how the energy is being deposited within the matter of the um, bunker walls. And then obviously the Monte Carlo simulations also allow for the changes of um, shielding to be simulated and the effects to be analysed such that we can then determine the effects of changes without having to actually physically implement them, which is obviously more um, cost effective. So the aims of my project are threefold. So the first of which is to produce an accurate Monte Carlo model of the Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, Mary Linac head and the surrounding bunker, and then to validate the results produced by the simulated model with measured data such that we can then work on the optimization of Linac bunker shielding. So this involves determining if there are any weak spots in the shielding to then um, 
up the shielding there to uh, satisfy shielding requirements. And then also looking at the efficiency of the bunker design. So reducing the um, land usage of the bunker design, as well as reducing the actual amount of materials and cost associated with construction of a bunker. So a brief overview of the publications relevant to my project. So in terms of Monte Carlo modeling, there's been a fair, a fairly large number of papers that have looked at producing a Monte Carlo model of the NAC bunker. However, the majority tend to be in different codes or looking at different aspects of the design and um, uh, shielding capabilities as I've uh, looked at. So in terms of code, most papers are using MCNP primarily um, as it deals with neutrons a lot better than gate does, which does end up being one of the limiting factors I've struggled with a fair bit. And then the other uh, important bit to look at when looking at the Monte Carlo modeling is the number of histories used. So most papers are using between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10 um, primary particles when simulating their bunker designs. So this is kind of um, often a limiting factor in that the, uh, deals with the associated computational time and uh, required to actually produce a uh, uncertainty, a relevant uncertainty that we can take uh, reasonable data off. So uh, the 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 8 particle counts have, I've found in my project to be usable, whereas 10 to the 8 has been much more limiting. Uh, then looking at validation of the bunker design. So the most popular method within the literature has been to place uh, survey meters of some description within the bunker and then compare the results taken by those to the Monte Carlo simulation. So ideally we'd like to also look at things like uh, radiation survey results from the commissioning of the LUNAC bunker, but as these are taking results from outside of the actual um, bunker room, so the uncertainty becomes very high in the simulator results if we're only getting a couple of particles in a billion going through these walls and actually reaching the um, detectors being simulated. So there's also been a couple of publications looking at different aspects of optimizing bunker design or different problems associated with it. So this has been broken down into four main areas. So wall thickness is one of them. So looking at the potential uh, benefits of re reducing the primary and secondary barrier thicknesses in most cases to uh, compensate for that overshielding. Uh, also looking at different materials used in the walls, so dealing with higher and lower density concretes and their effect on the shielding capabilities, as well as changes to the maze design. So most literature deals primarily with the length and width of the maze, as well as the difference between single, triple and uh, single, double and triple bend mazes in their reduction to the dose at the entrance of the maze. A number of novel improvements have also been trialed. So this is primarily in regards to lead and steel layering within the bunker and being applied to the walls of the bunker and or maze, as well as some other more uh, novel improvements such as the use of nanoparticle doped concrete. So this literature has informed my project plan. So my project plan can be split into three main components, the first of which being the Monte Carlo modeling stage. So here we produce a mesh model of the Mary Linux bunker using the floor plan shown a few slides ago. So once we've got that, uh, made up in Monte Carlo, we can then produce a model of the Linac cage used in the Mary Bunker, so a variant true beam. So uh, establish all the major components of the Linac cage such that we can then simulate a holistic uh, beam from there. And then storing the beam as it uh, leaves the Linac head in a phase space file. So what this does is stores the uh, energy direction, uh, particle type, etc., of the particles impacting that Base base plane to a file such that we can then sample from that file when simulated in the bunker itself. So we don't need to rerun these particles and really cut down the computational time required. Uh, we're also looking at uh, implement, the implementation of variance reduction techniques. So primarily in regard to branch styling splitting. So what this does is when we track our individual particles as they go through the bunker, say we take one photon, we'll split that into 100 uh, other photons and then weight them to one one hundredth of the original such that when we assign the uh, random number generated probabilities to each of these, they will then take different potential tracks uh, that could have been followed by the original, such that the statistical uncertainty is lowered by that uh, increased factor, as we're now simulating effectively more particles, but with uh, very little extra computational cost. 
So then moving into the data validation section, we're looking at three main sections of data validation. The first of which is comparing the depth dose curve within the water phantom between the simulated and measured results. Then looking at the tenth value layer within the primary barrier from the uh, documented value and simulated values, as well as a comparison of the energy deposition within the scatter from the um, measured and simulated values as well. And then look at the optimization of the bunker. So this is broken down into four main sections. So changes to the wall thickness, that being the primary and secondary wall barrier wall thicknesses. Uh, the addition of the use of different bunker materials. So looking at higher and lower density shielding concretes used and the um, modification of the maze geometry. So looking primarily in regards to the width of the maze used as well as the angles of the triple bend maze. Uh, some novel improvements have also been investigated. So primarily in regard to the addition of extra shielding layers to the uh, walls of the bunker. So that being uh, a lead layer to the maze, a steel layer to the internal room of the bunker, as well as a dual lead concrete layer in the bunker as well. So when we look at the actual Monte Carlo modeling of the Linac head, you can see we've got the uh, model produced in Monte Carlo on the right here. So we're producing our electron beam initially just at the origin point here, and then tracking that as it impacts with um, the tungsten target, it results in Bremsstrahlen X-rays being created, and then as they're collimated through that primary collimator, impact through the thartonic filter and ionization chambers and so on, we track those to um, to then determine their parameters as they reach the jaws. Uh, collimated to the appropriate 40 by 40 centimeter field size that ice center used for the majority of simulations and are then stored in that phase space plane, so the white box there. Uh, so you can see the phase space plane is also substantially larger than the gap between the jaws is. So that's useful in that we're still managing to store most of the higher energy leakage radiation that may actually affect the shielding capabilities while not having to waste computational power on storing any of the lower energy leakage radiation that uh, won't be as effective in uh, shielding calculations. So we can then take that phase space plane and input that into the model of the uh, Linac bunker below. So you can see we've taken the floor pan of the Mary Linac bunker and produced that into a 3D model in OpenSCAD and then put that into gate, the Monte Carlo code used, such that we can then simulate the bunker design. So you can see the walls in yellow, the floor and roof in grey and the internals of the room in red, as well as a water phantom in the centre of the room in blue there to use as a scatterer and a little white uh, line, which is that phase space plane reappearing again in the centre of the bunker just to the left there. So that's where all our particles are being generated from. And then of course that's been moved in 90 degree increments around the uh, water box to account for the different use factors of the walls. So. With this kind of model, what we're able to do is look at the energy deposition within the walls of the bunker as well as the air within it. So this is a sample simulation run that shows we've got the beam produced in the center of, um, or just off the center of the bunker here, impacting with that uh, water phantom. So the, the very lightly colored uh, square there, and then continuing on and then impacting with the primary barrier. So obviously this isn't a log plot, so you can see the light areas are obviously much more intensive in radiation and energy deposition, whereas the dark areas have much, much lower energy deposition experienced. So the important things to take note of here is that towards the end of the maze, we get very little in the way of any energy deposition. So the maze is actually acting as intended to reduce that dose to the entrance, as well as very little in the way of any particles actually passing through the walls themselves. So um, just important to take note of for future comparisons. So looking at the validation of the data, you can see when we look at the depth dose curve within the water phantom, you can see our simulated results in orange and our measured results in blue and the difference between them in green. So you can see after that initial peak in the difference in the buildup region, we have a fairly low difference between our simulated and measured values. So you can see we have a Written with square value of 1.08% when we normalized the maximum and discard that initial um, peaking difference. So this obviously indicates a fairly good comparison between the two values. So this was taken for a 6 MV beam, and then we've also ran simulations of the 
um, PDD with beam energies between 5.9 and 6.1 MV, ranging in 0.05 MV increments, and then taking the RMS values of those uh, PDD curves as well. So the important bit to note here really is that our lowest RMS values are still occurring with uh, 6 MV beam. So it just gives us that peace of mind that the um, LINAC and simulations are uh, aligned in energy, I guess. So we don't have the LINAC performing slightly under the MV range uh, listed, I guess. Uh, then can look at the um, centered uh, at the tenth value layer of the primary barrier. So we're looking at the energy deposition in the primary barrier as a function of depth. So you can see it still follows that same kind of um, uh, photon attenuation curve. So uh, the simulated results are shown in blue here with the tenth value of the 10% energy deposition line shown in purple. So these two lines intersecting at 44.0 centimeters, which uh, gives us 98% uh, of the documented value of the 45 centimeter 10th value layer for an 18 MV beam. So again, showing a high level of agreement between the simulated and measured results here. Then looking at the data validation of the scattered energy um, deposition within the bunker, you can see what we've done is split the bunker into a three by four grid such that we can then take uh, measurements of the energy deposition at, of the dose rates at the center of each of these grids using a radiation survey meter. And then we produce a Monte Carlo model to simulate this using air boxes at each of the grid locations. So these are one meter cubed air boxes to try and uh, gather up as many or track as many particles as they deposit as they travel through them as possible to reduce our statistical uncertainty. So obviously these boxes are a fair bit larger being one meter cubed rather than the um, 280 centimeter cubed uh, sensitive region of the sur survey meter used. So when we look at the results between the uh, measured and simulated uh, dose rates within the bunker, we see a fairly good level of agreement between the two. So the only one that is potentially visible in these dose maps is at the position number six, the actual just 20 centimeters off to the side of Isolana. So we can see hopefully that the measured dose rate is slightly higher than the simulated. But this is better shown in this bar plot here where we can see the Monte Carlo simulation is really underestimating the absolute dose rate measured in the center of the plot. So this is due to two main reasons. So the first of which being the measurement taken using the survey meter was at 4.8 sieverts per hour whereas the server meter itself was actually rated at a maximum operating range of 50 millisieverts per hour. So we're several orders of magnitude above the operating range listed. So it isn't the most accurate measurement uh, taken from there. And additionally, the Monte Carlo simulation is also suffering from volume averaging as the larger air box size used to reduce the uncertainty for the other measurements taken in the Bunker works against us here in that the higher dose gradients towards the center of the um, bunker where the beam is um, being generated results in that volume averaging from the much larger uh, airbox size that the dose act has been applied to as opposed to the smaller uh, region of the uh, of the server meter. Uh, additionally, once we remove that uh, grid location number six, you can see we have a much better comparison between the simulated and measured results. So with that position removed, you can see we get a good level of agreement between the two. So we can then move on to making changes to the um, bunker design to try and optimize the design. So in terms of the primary barrier, we've looked at the changing the thickness of the primary barrier by plus or minus 37 centimeters, so one tenth value layer, as well as doing the same for the secondary barrier. So again, change it by that one tenth value layer. So for the results produced by these, you can see we've produced a number of energy deposition graphs. So the top three corresponding to the changes in the primary barrier and the bottom three corresponding to the changes in the secondary barrier. So in regards to the primary barrier changes, the important bit to take note of is that when we look at the energy deposition in the primary barrier, we get very little in the way of energy dep deposition towards the actual end of the primary barrier. So we don't get that solid line from where the dose actors at the uh, applied to the voxels at the end of the uh, primary barrier have been applied. 
So we get the beam being basically fully attenuated by the time it reaches the end of the primary barrier, even in the case of the minus 37 centimetre um, primary beam, uh, minus 37 centimetre primary barrier. Uh, in terms of the secondary barrier, we can see that the main feature to pay attention to is along the line of y equals 6,000. We can see, especially in the plus 37 centimetre uh, secondary barrier energy deposition graph, so on that lower right, that we have the white region in the wall separating the maze from the main room of the Lenac bunker. So we get a high degree of overshielding there, as is quite visibly present, whereas once we move towards that minus 37 centimetre secondary, that becomes less so. Uh, we've then also made plots of the secondary barriers again and their energy deposition as a function of width. So you can see this is taken along that red line. And when we look at the uh, barrier separating the maze from the uh, main room of the Linac, we have that sharp decrease in dose towards the centre of that wall around that 1,100 um, mark or so, um, uh, 1,100 centimetre width. So this obviously indicates a fair degree of overshielding there where that dose is dropping more than is realistically necessary. Uh, when we then look at decreasing the width of that barrier, however, we get a much uh, lower drop in that dose there. So showing that we can effectively reduce that 10th value layer without too much um, loss in shielding capabilities. Doing the opposite, however, we see that the uh, opposite is obviously, of course, true. So uh, adding that extra 10th value layer to the secondary barrier adds uh, uh, unnecessary number amount of shielding. So there's the potential for the, the reduction of, of one tenth value layer achievable in both the primary and secondary barriers. So using Rishkin's value of three thousand dollars per cubic meter of shielding concrete, this comes out to about an eighty-five thousand dollar prime um, saving for the construction of the primary barrier and two hundred ten thousand for the secondary barrier. So giving a total saving of two hundred ninety-five thousand dollars there potentially for new bunker design constructions. We also looked at adjusting the width of the maze by plus or minus 50 centimetres, as well as changing the triple bend angles by plus or minus 2, 4 and 6 degrees. So when we look at the results of the uh, uh, energy deposition or the dose rates within the, the dose within the maze, uh, this, these points are corresponding to the grid locations shown previously when by looking at the scattered radiation dose. So you can see at position number four, which is the entrance of the dose, we get a 45% dose reduction at the maze entrance for the narrow maze. And we also are able to save five and a half square meters of floor space. Additionally, looking at the triple bend maze, uh, we can see changing the angle by both the positive and negative angles actually uh, results in a dose reduction at the maze entrance, and that's up to 35% using the positive angle maze changes. Then look at the addition of lead layering and steel layering to the internal walls of the bunker. So the lead layering being to the uh, walls of the um, to the walls of the maze and the floor of the maze being in two and five millimeter thicknesses, and steel layering to the internal room of the bunker in twenty and forty millimeter um, thicknesses. So obviously these uh, are hampered slightly in their efforts by the lack of neutron production, neutron simulation possible in gate. So these results do need to be taken with a grain of sand or two. But when we look at the dose reductions due to the lead at the maze entrance, we can see with the two and five millimeter uh, thicknesses, we're able to reduce the dose for, um, dose by 85 and 88 percent respectively, which is in range with the 80 percent suggested for a two millimeter um, thick lead layering suggested by Alafan in 2017. Uh, additionally, looking at the steel layering, we can see we can reduce the dose to the walls quite substantially when using the thicker layers of steel. So again, without being able to properly simulate for the photoneutron production, we're very much limited by the accuracy of these simulations and what we can really take away in terms of dose reductions. However, in just terms of in terms of just the photon attenuation, we can quite clearly reduce the necessary uh, thickness of concrete required. So there may be some um, effectiveness here where if we need to run a much thinner, um, to run a smaller barrier uh, bunker design than usual and thickness is really of the highest priority, 
and steel could be viable. However, at a cost of $17.2,000 per cubic metre as compared to the $3,000 for shielding concrete, uh, it would come at a much higher cost. Additionally, looking at dual and lead concrete, uh, dual lead and concrete layering, so adding one millimetre of lead and 37 centimetres of concrete as um, to the internals of the wall. But you can also look at changes to the bunker materials, so looking at the higher and lower density concretes, so serpentine being lower density of 2.1 grams per centimetre cubed and datalite, galena, steel magnetite, and magnetite lead as higher density concretes. So with the addition of the dual lead concrete layer, we can see the energy deficient to the concrete of the walls has been uh, reduced quite substantially. And then looking again at along that line of Y equals 6,000, we can see we have uh, the much larger um, region of overshielding present in that wall separating the maze and the primary barrier. So if we go back to the results from the changes to the secondary barrier, we can see this is adding a full extra 10th value layer of concrete. So this can be quite easily removed to for savings of 14 square meters and $165,000 in shielding concrete when we add that one millimeter of lead behind the first 10th value layer of concrete. Also looking at the energy deposition for the different uh, materials. So the serpentine has that much lower dose drop off than the regular concrete. So the regular being green and the serpentine and purple. And then those high density concretes have that uh, uh, sharper drop off gradient. So these can allow for a higher uh, for reduction of about 17% in barrier thicknesses. So for a primary barrier, this drops the, prime, the required thickness from 220, 220 centimetres down to 183 and 130 down to 108 for the secondary thicknesses. So this project has mainly been limited by the lack of neutrons simulated. So this becomes especially difficult when we deal with the lead and concrete simulations as well, the high density concretes where the high Z number really drops that threshold energy for photoneutron production down quite significantly. So most of our simulations have been limited in scope to that kind of 6 MV range where uh, neutrons are less of uh, a risk in, uh, less of a risk and less effective in our chewing calculations. Uh, also, in terms of improvements, we're also limited by the number of histories and used. So a factor of another 10 histories used would have been quite helpful, as well as the voxel sizes used would have ideally been reduced to um, provide more specific findings. So for future work, we should ideally include uh, neutrons in later simulations and move away from gate and potentially something like M MNCP as our Monte Carlo code of choice. Uh, potentially extend the model uh, this investigation to look at multiple bunker designs and beam energies, try and find a more generalized model, and then obviously employing a Bayesian optimization algorithm to better optimize uh, the bunker designs rather than trial and erroring. Uh, a few different changes at a time. And obviously, if we I can if we ideally we would like to create a generalized model so you can input a bunker design and then produce uh, the optimized design from there. So inclusion, the Monte Carlo simulations can be used to produce an accurate model of the Sir Charles Gardner Hospital Mary Lennox head and surrounding bunker. And then the simulated results have been validated with measured data with the optimization process have, um, provide a number of recommendations that can potentially improve, uh, decrease bunker construction costs by over $300,000. So uh, I'd just like to thank you, thank, give a thank you to David and Pedgeman for their help along the way, and also to their Monte Carlo Research Class members, so Marcus, Marsha and James for their support and advice. So thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Great, thanks very much, um, Gavin. Any questions from Gavin? Yes, Munir, you have a question. Hi, Gavin. That was a very interesting talk. And uh, very good uh, to see, like, you're doing simulations for uh, banker shieldings, Monte Carlo simulations. If you go back to slide 15, you have shown, like, a measurement versus, uh, yeah, Monte mm -hmm. Carlo versus measured. Can you? Explain how did you manage to compare the measure versus Monte Carlo? Yeah, so when we were looking at the measured results, we were using the radiation survey meter that gave uh, results uh, that gave dose rates in millisieverts per hour. So as we knew the monitor units used to, um, so we we're using the 10 MV beam with 
uh, 600 monos units for over a period of 10 seconds. So out between 100 monos units. As a monos unit is defined as like a centigrade of dose at the water box, we can then normalize the simulated dose to the water box by that um, factor of one centigrade, such that we can then remove the time dependency and then just deal with um, uh, uh, so you still have the millisieverts from the measured, but you're now working in grays in terms of simulated. And then as we're just dealing with a photon beam and a water box, we can then use the tissue and radiation weighting factors of one to convert those both to millisieverts per hour. So I guess technically it would be more accurate to list both of these in just millisieverts rather than millisieverts per hour, but the equivalence would still be there. So um, that's how we've kind of converted from the simulated and radiation and measured results into that one combined data set. Does that answer the question? OK, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Martin. Yeah, thanks for that, Kevin. It was terrific. Um, just to, to clarify something, when you're doing the maze entrance dose rate calculations, was that, was that a fixed beam direction or was that some somehow sampled from multiple beam directions? Uh, so the measured results in terms of when we're looking at the scatter, so the results shown here, that was all with the beam uh, going directly down. However, all the simulated results when we were taking the, the simulated measurements of dose of the maze entrance, that was using the beam at the uh, 0, 90, 180, 270 degree measurements. So we're still trying to simulate that proper use factor of each of the um, four dimensions of 0.25. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Yep, that, that yeah. makes sense, that's good. Um, just maybe just from the a bit of physics, like how does the lead lining reduce the maze entrance dose? What's the mechanism there? The lead lining. So our photoneutrons are produced by the giant dipole resonance effect, I believe, from memory. Uh, so when we're dealing with the higher Z material, oh, sorry, ignore the, ignore the photoneutron bit there. Um, so when we're dealing with the photon attenuation, the attenuation is highly dependent on the Z number of the materials. So when we move from the shielding concrete to the lead, we uh, our effective Z number increases quite substantially. So the uh, the attenuation. Sorry, I'm just going to restart. I've, I've that's all right. So yeah, so when we're looking at attenuating the photons, the the drop off is based off the Compton effect for the most part. So we're dealing with a Z cubed dependency. So when we move from the shielding concrete, which is a relatively low um, Z number, to the lead, which is the of the higher Z number, that increases the um, the attenuation quite substantially. So then we are uh, able to more effectively reduce that um, photon dose. However, obviously this is limited to working at that lower energy range, which is why we can't apply that lead to the inner layers of the walls, as we're then dealing with more of that uh, photoneutron production, which is kind of counterintuitive for them producing more dose than we're potentially reducing. Yeah, 